here at the Amadeus Capital Partners office here in London. Hi, I'm Herman Hauser. I'm the founder of uh, Acorn Computers, which spun out ARM. So, uh, how do you feel about ARM? And uh, so, this is huge, no? This is like. Yes, well, uh, uh, ARM is my uh, proudest achievement in my life, and uh, as uh, people uh, probably know, there is a uh, cumulative uh, sales uh, number of ARM of uh, over 70 billion uh, arms in the world, which means that on average there are 10 arms that have been sold uh, for every person on Earth. So, uh, I interviewed Sophie Wilson, and uh, she said that it was a plan, that it was MIPS for the masses. So she said she was not even uh, surprised. But are you a little bit surprised what happened? The, <clears throat> the actual phenomenal amount of uh, uh, <clears throat> numbers of arms that have been sold worldwide in the end did come as a, as a great surprise to me. Uh, I knew it was going to be very successful because of the uh, outstanding properties that ARM has in terms of power consumption and the simplicity of the instruction set, uh, which uh, uh, was very well received by the <clears throat> by the industry. But that it would become the dominant uh, microprocessor in the world uh, was not something that I expected. It's it's gotta be an interesting feeling to have, right? To you walk around the planet, you walk around anywhere, and you you just know that. Uh, you know, you had a part in, 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 in that it happened, that uh, yes. all these devices are using ARM. Yes, well, it's very satisfying to give lectures anywhere in the world, as you uh, suggested, uh, and I uh, can count on over 90% of the people in the audience having one of my uh, products in their pockets because we've got uh, a 95% uh, market share in um, mobile phones and most people now carry mobile phones with them. So back then in Cambridge, uh, how was the atmosphere? How did it feel to go to the office every day and, and, and how do you, do you find all these uh, guys that you were working with? Uh, well, you know, if we uh, look back at history of how the, how the arm was created, it was uh, one of the most um, exciting and satisfying uh, events in my life when the ARM uh, chip came back from uh, the foundry and I bought two bottles of champagne to celebrate. Uh, we plugged the ARM in, in the development system and of course it didn't work. So this was a great disappointment. But two hours later, they called me back into the R&D department and told me that it now works. So within two hours, they managed to debug, to debug a completely new chip. And it actually said, hello world, I'm an arm, which meant that the arm worked, the circuit board that they had constructed uh, <clears throat> worked, that the software that they had written for a processor that didn't exist until then uh, worked and put up the uh, the note, uh, hello world, I'm an arm. So, so then we opened the bottles of champagne and we had a very, uh, very good time. So were you talking about the strategy back then of uh, 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 computer companies having to do their own silicon or yes. they would fail, right? So uh, yes, that was part I, um, of the strategy. I gave many <clears throat> um, talks at the time um, when I argued that there will be two types of computer companies. Uh, those that have learned how to design on silicon, and then those that will be dead. And I wanted to be one of those companies uh, that designed on silicon, and that's uh, what we did. Originally, we didn't want to do a microprocessor. Um, from the beginning of Acorn Computers, we always had um, custom chips for video, uh, for the serial I.O., um, and uh, it was only later when we realized that the 6502 microprocessor, which was an 8-bit microprocessor, a very good microprocessor, also used by Apple II, and we used it for the BBC microcomputer, but it just wasn't powerful enough for all the new software and all the new ideas that we had. So we went out and looked for a 32-bit processor. Uh, we actually liked uh, the Intel 80 a 286 quite well, but they wouldn't give us uh, just the die, and we uh, accused them of uh, doing a stupid pinout because they put both the address and the data bus on the same pins, and we argued that you couldn't make a sensible computer out of that uh, because we needed low latency, because we always 
uh, multiplex the screen and the main memory uh, <coughs> on the same uh, DRAM chips, which was a, a very efficient way of uh, building a, a very fast computer with very good graphics. Uh, and they would uh, allow us to have the die and do our own pinout. If they had allowed us, we would have never done the ARM. So uh, the only reason why we did the ARM is that Intel wouldn't sell us the 8286 uh, die so that we could do our own pinout. Back then, were you meeting with people like Andy Grove or some other people at Intel? I did meet Andy Grove at one of Esther Dyson's uh, conference. I remember having breakfast with him, but that wasn't uh, the discussion. Uh, at that time, uh, we didn't work on the arm yet. And uh, <clears throat> because Acon was such a small company that never uh, really went, went up high enough in the Intel uh, hierarchy, it was some uh, lower uh, uh, level managers that made that decision. So. That was a close, uh, close thing, right? Uh, Intel didn't want to work with you, so you made ARM. Yes. So we said, uh, well, sto the story actually uh, that I always tell is that Intel actually said, when we asked them whether we could just buy the, uh, the die, they said, look, get lost. <laughs> so we said, well, you get lost, we'll do our <laughs> own. <laughs> you know, because we were arrogant enough at the time, because we were uh, very successful at Acorn. We were the first company to go from zero to 100 million pound revenue in just five years. Uh, uh, so we were, uh, you know, a very successful, a great success in Britain. Uh, so we, we dared to produce our own microprocessor. Little did I know that it was going to become so um, uh, spectacularly successful. So Intel actually said get lost? Or is it well, some that's how I tell it. They, they, yeah. they didn't, I'm sure they didn't actually <laughs> said get lost. They said, look, why, why, why why do you think that Intel would tell you, sell you the die? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, we, we are a, a chip company, we sell you the chip if you want it, but you can't tinker with our chip. We're, we're just um, too important a company for a little uh, British company to change our chips. So uh, that was the story about Intel, and then there's, uh, there was Apple was starting around the same time as Acorn, right? That That's thing. right, just uh, a year earlier than us, I think. And uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's probably not widely known that uh, the survival of Apple actually depended on ARM. Um, and this is a story that John Scully tells, not me. If you um, Google John, John Scully's uh, biography of Steve Jobs and ARM, you'll find a paragraph that says uh, that Apple would have gone bust had Apple not been able to sell their one and a half million dollar investment in uh, ARM, which bought them 43%. Uh, and they managed to sell it for 800 million at the time when they were in deep financial trouble. That was before the iMac and stuff? It was in, in yes, that was during the, during the time that uh, John Scully was running Apple. And um, Apple was in great difficulty at the time before Steve Jobs returned. And uh, Steve Jobs used ARM a lot in the iPod and... He used ARM everywhere. It was, of course, in the iPod, which became a great success, and then the iPhone, and then the iWatch, and um, all the A-series, um, the A4, the A5, and the A6, they're all, uh, of course, ARM-based uh, uh, microprocessors. So did you meet Steve Jobs back then in the 80s? I did indeed, yes. Uh, um, in the early 80s, uh, Esther Dyson's conference and the Agenda conference was where everybody met at the time. So Bill Gates, uh, Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison, um, Eric Schmidt, they were all at these conferences and we often had uh, uh, dinner together. So it was, um, it was an interesting time because all these people, of course, weren't famous yet. <laughs> And uh, so there was this guy called Larry Tesla, right? And, and he was uh, instrumental and, and uh, together with you and together with VLSI uh, starting the spin-out? That's right. Larry Tesla was uh, in charge of the Apple Newton and he made the decision to make the investment in, um, uh, in ARM. And uh, the, the thinking was because you're a small company, you would actually support it? What was that? Yes, it was an interesting decision because he was actually working with uh, AT&T Microelectronics at the time. And AT&T Microelectronics was a $2 billion company. And they had a, um, a processor called the Hobbit, 
which was actually quite a good processor, very comparable to the ARM. Uh, but he was very frustrated in his relationship with AT&T Microelectronics. And uh, AT&T Microelectronics had done uh, a microprocessor before that they then didn't support. So Larry was very worried that um, AT&T will do the same again with The Hobbit, that they'd have a good product, but they wouldn't know how to sell it, and therefore they will discontinue it, which is actually what happened. But he trusted a small Cambridge company, and it was extraordinary for a, 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 a senior Apple um, manager to think uh, that way. He thought, well, that little Cambridge company has nowhere else to go. They've got to make a success of the arm. And that's what they did. And that's why he was willing to change from the Hobbit. He had already, he had a Hobbit design and changed to the arm design, uh, uh, partially for that reason and partially because, uh, of course, the arm was low, lower power, which was important. So how do you pitch to Larry Tesla? How do you f connect with him or uh, get into these discussions to, to have him, did he just show up because he knew about it? Or did you No, we were working on a, um, uh, there was a, a Cambridge uh, startup called Active Book Company, and we uh, and he wanted to work with us on, on and find out what we were doing at the Active Book Company. And I told him it was ARM-based and showed him what we um, uh, what the Active Book Company could do. And then he was getting very interested in the ARM because he realised it was uh, a really very a powerful uh, processor that uh, was exactly what he looked for 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 the Newton pro project. And he had the, the power to do that investment, 1.5 million? One or? and a half million was nothing for <laughs> Apple at the time, yes he, he was did. was nothing? He didn't he, even have to ask the CEO? No, 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 he did, he did ask Scully, yes, uh, uh, whether he could do that, but... Um, do you know what but, kind of discussions they had, or he just said, let me do it? And it, it probably was a very simple discussion, as, uh, you know, I'd like to make this small investment in Cambridge, and uh, Scully said, ah, oh, sure, go ahead. <laughs> And uh, so, and then there's uh, uh, Bill Gates. Did he he visited you once, right? Uh, yes, he visited uh, us at uh, Acorn. This was before ARM. And uh, I remember Sophie Wilson showing off his uh, BBC Basic to him. Uh, it was clear that BBC Basic had many features and, and was running a lot faster than uh, MS Basic, the Microsoft Basic, which Bill Gates himself is the only program that Bill himself uh, wrote. Uh, and um, you know, Bill was, was was impressed. Was impressed, but uh, so you were better than Microsoft. You were better. Than oh, we were clearly better. We had a, a better uh, a basic interpreter, but we also had a much better operating. So he wanted to sell me MS DOS, and I I could tell him, Bill, we can't take such a retrograde step. Uh, look at our operating system, which is which actually is a real operating system. It was miles better uh, than his operating system at the time. Of course, he improved his operating system later. And I could sit him down and say, and by the way, you can uh, write, uh, if you're a, a schoolboy in a British school, you can write star I am Johnny, and you're logged on to uh, the local area network. <clears throat> and then you can use the same uh, load and save commands as with the, with the floppy disk, and it all goes through the network to a server. And Bill's reaction to that was, what's a network? <laughs> And we had, we had always, we've never sold a, a product, a, um, a computer at Acorn Computers without a network connection because that's one of uh, the great strengths in Cambridge. Uh, we have a close relationship with Andy Hopper, who is now the head of the computer lab, who invented uh, the Cambridge Ring, which was one of the leading um, uh, networking uh, uh, local area networks in the world at the time. Yeah. So, and then there was uh, Apple at the time doing the Apple One, maybe Apple Two and stuff like that. And would you say, do you want to answer? Or maybe you can, uh, yeah. yeah. That was my wife. Uh, yes, Pamela, yes. Okay. Let me just get it. You don't have to, you don't have to come if you, you don't have to come if you don't want to. Yeah. Okay, see you later. Bye-bye. So there was a, the Apple. Uh, how, how, do you, yep. no, no, how do you... Yeah. Uh, how do you think the Acorn was comparing with what Apple had back then? Well, at the time, Apple II was uh, uh, one of the most popular 
um, computers in the United States, and we had the BBC Micro, which actually in the UK had a 60% market share. And one of the reasons for that was that the BBC Micro was just miles better than the Apple II in every respect. It ran twice as fast. It was black and white in color. It mixed graphics and text on the same screen, uh, which the Apple couldn't do at the time. The Apple w was also only um, black and white. And it had a network connection, which Apple didn't have at the time. So we had all the advantages uh, at the time over Apple. Uh, but of course, Apple then brought out the Macintosh, which became a great success. Uh, so it was a good price also compared to what Apple had? Yes, and it also was a lot cheaper. A lot cheaper? Yes. So you were much better than Apple, much better than Microsoft? Yes. Uh, much better than Intel? Yes. But um, why, didn't, why were you not able to, um, I don't know how to say, but kind of like kill them in the US? That's a very good question and I've been asked that uh, many times before and there's a very simple answer to that and that is just the size of the British market. We dominated uh, the British market with a 60% market share but that was nothing compared with the uh, US market and we had a very naive way of uh, going into the US market. We started our own subsidiary and uh, we didn't hire the right people. We spent a lot of uh, uh, money trying to preserve uh, one of the great advantages of the BBC Micro, that it had lots and lots of connections. But because it had so many connections, it was very difficult uh, to get past the FCC regulations. They had very stringent um, emission regulations. And because we had all these connectors, and they were radiating like hell, so it took us a lot of time and a lot of money to, uh, uh, to re-engineer the company and uh, to re-engineer the, the product. And by the time we put the product on the market, it was, uh, it was already too late and we actually lost a lot of money in the, in the US. So is it just the FCC kind of yes. like putting a barrier, kind of anti-competitive or not really, but I guess it would have been, f uh, they would have let you in if you passed the test, I guess. But yes. is it just the FCC or is it like a different style of business? Because maybe those companies in the U.S. are more cunning or more aggressive or more, you know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, well, they the, delay, the delay was the, uh, the FCC delay because uh, of the particular engineering approach that we had taken. With hindsight, what we should have done is just uh, close down all the connectivity that we were so proud of uh, because the computer itself was was much better than the Apple anyway without the connectivity. And I re remember that uh, Apple actually was very worried about uh, our computer. I remember people on the board saying, well, they, they are the most serious competitor that we, uh, we're going to have. But because of the delay, uh, we never got traction in the... Um, in the uh, uh, American market. I think if we had brought the, out the product a year or two earlier, uh, uh, then we could have become a serious competitor to Apple. And uh, Intel became a huge business also selling on chips. Um, I guess this is just uh, the business model, right? They have a business model of making a lot of money and... Uh, yes, well, the main difference in the business model between Intel and ARM, of course, is that Intel is a semiconductor company that sells chips. ARM is a licensing company that just sells license uh, to other manufacturers to produce the chips. And that turned out to be a major strategic advantage because the fight was actually not of Intel versus ARM, but it was Intel versus the rest of the world because all the semiconductor companies in the world have ARM licenses. So Qualcomm, Apple, Toshiba, Sony, uh, all these companies have ARM licenses and they produce their own microprocessors. Uh, and of course, that's much cheaper for them because they don't need to buy the uh, processors from a, a semiconductor company. And the royalty that ARM gets is quite small compared with the uh, margins that, of course, Intel can command. And so the ARM was originally designed for a computer, for PC. Yes. Uh, but then Nokia came in and kind of uh, um, shifted the whole focus for ARM and mobile, right? And it's still, right. it's still kind of mostly focused in mobile. Uh, that's right. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Uh, the ARM was uh, designed for the BBC microcomputer as a successor microprocessor to the 6502, with which it has uh, a lot in common. And uh, power consumption was actually not uh, one of the main design objectives other 
then we wanted to make sure that the uh, chip would fit into a plastic package because the plastic package was a lot cheaper than ceramic packages and we didn't want to have a heat sink. So uh, it wasn't really that the arm was designed for portable computers that were battery powered, but we wanted to have a low power device in our BBC Micro that didn't need a, a heat sink. Uh, little did we know that this uh, became such a, a huge difference to uh, other processors that it was the ideal processor for mobile phones. At that time, we were 20 times uh, more power efficient uh, than Intel and other processors. It really was a spectacular uh, power difference that we managed to achieve at the same performance. So, and you also had the fastest performance, right? We had the fastest performance, and that was the reason, uh, just that, that one component, that ARM processor was the reason why Acon could survive against uh, Intel uh, and PCs for another 10 years. So the, the company continued selling its, uh, uh, its PCs, which were much higher performance than the Intel-based computers and had much better graphics than Intel-based computers for another 10 years. And your team designing this first ARM chip and the, the following, they were like geniuses, right? They were. Um, I mean, Steve Ferber and uh, Sophie Wilson in particular, the two people who uh, made the original design. Uh, of course, the, uh, there was also a big uh, um, uh, silicon design team, but the architecture was defined by these two people as opposed to 50 people, which typical microprocessor groups at Intel or AMD uh, would help design an architecture. So because it was such a small group, as far as I know, it's the only a processor in the world that was designed by just two people uh, and um, uh, that uh, made for a very harmonious and very uh, a usable instruction set. And that instruction, the, it must be said that the instruction set uh, was a stroke of genius by Sophie Wilson. Uh, the instruction sets of risk-based computers are normally uh, simulated for many, many months as IBM did. They, they simulated the, their risk architecture for a whole year, simulating how uh, Unix and uh, the C compiler would run on their risk machine. Uh, we didn't have a, a, a mainframe computer, so we asked Sophie what the um, instruction set should be, and a week later she had written down arguably one of the best instruction sets uh, in the world, and she did all the optimization just in her head. So, uh, how was she back then, and, uh, and, and Steve Ferber, could you try to describe, uh, how, were they like geeks, or were they like... Well, they were both uh, members of the uh, Cambridge Microprocessor Group, which was a student group that were, was interested in microprocessors, and microprocessors were such an exciting uh, development in computing that all the students wanted to be uh, working with microprocessors, and there was a, a very vibrant microprocessor group that actually produced little kits that they, they, they actually produced little home computer uh, uh, kits themselves and Steve had one based on the 2650, Signetix 2650 I remember and uh, Sophie was known as the CMOS guy, he was an expert at, at CMOS uh, uh, chips so in those days uh, CMOS was not yet the dominant uh, 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 process. Uh, there were NMOS and PMOS products as well, and uh, bipolar products. So uh, that's how I got to know them when they were still at the microprocessor group. So uh, you were walking around the university, and you were doing your your uh, things nearby, right? PhD in 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 physics. Uh, yes, I did my PhD in physics, and when I finished that, I met Chris Curry, and we started Acorn Computers together, and uh, he. I, I remember uh, I said, yeah, Chris, it's a good idea to start a company, but what are we going to do? And he said, uh, well, it's all happening in microprocessors. Let's do something with microprocessors. And that was our business plan. You know, there was, that was it. Uh, and then we went to the local bank and wanted a loan. And the bank manager said, um, it's very good to see these young people start companies. And then he did his due diligence and said, now, which college did you go to? And it was the bank that was opposite King's College, so I could point out of his window and say, this one. And he said, oh, very good, here is 10,000 pounds, <laughs> uh, get started. Uh, 
and that was uh, how the business was financed. There was no venture capital at the time. And how much did you invest yourself? You and Chris Gurry is the Oh, uh, we both invested a lot of money. Uh, it was first 50 pounds each, and <laughs> then uh, we doubled this to 100. So the, the, the total amount of money that ever went into Acorn Computers was uh, 100, uh, 200 pounds. But would you say that uh, making uh, computers is related with your PhD or not really? Uh, no, it, uh, it, uh, <clears throat> other than, of course, all the semiconductor industry is physics based and, uh, you know, I did my PhD in physics, uh, but I had to learn about computing and microprocessors. I remember I, one of the first things I, do, I did is I bought uh, Adam Osborne's book on microprocessors because I didn't know what a microprocessor was. And it was actually a very good book uh, explaining in, in great detail of how a microprocessor worked, what the uh, arithmetic logic unit was, uh, how the registers were organized, and uh, what the load, uh, load store architecture was. So um, uh, uh, that's what I did. And then there's this uh, movie called Microman where you were, were you really fighting with uh, Clive Sinclair? or is it Oh Mark? yes, because Chris, Chris had been working with Clive Sinclair before he left Sinclair uh, Radionics, as, we was called, as it was called, and then Science of Cambridge. Uh, and um, because he didn't want to work for Clive anymore, and then we started Acon Computers. But there's always been because uh, Sinclair produced a, a product called the uh, ZX80 and then the ZX Spectrum, uh, and we had the BBC Micro. There was a, a local fight between these two companies and who could sell more computers and who could bring out a better next generation machine. Is there any chance that you could have merged? Uh, you and Sinclair and kind of like took on Apple instead, like focus on... Instead no, of, uh, we had uh, completely little... different uh, philosophies. He was in the Z80 camp, we were in the 65 and 2 camp. Uh, and uh, uh, it was actually quite healthy that there was this competition. We, uh, 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 we created a lot of energy within uh, Acorn by uh, uh, knowing that there is a competitor in the same a town that uh, is also very good. So, uh, could you describe a little bit more uh, how, what is your role in, in ARM being spin out and how was the meetings and when you you uh, found the CEO and all the other stuff that happened to well, spin it the, out? Well, um, when I uh, met uh, Larry Tesla who was looking for a processor for his uh, a Newton machine, that's uh, <coughs> how the ARM, well, <laughs> actually started uh, three years earlier. So we decided at, uh, at Acorn that we really needed to spin out ARM because nobody would buy a microprocessor from a potential competitor because we used the ARM in our own uh, computer, of course. So uh, a, another computer company would always argue, well, uh, they will always have an advantage because they're designing the ARM. So we decided to spin it out. We almost had a deal uh, with Thompson in France for a European uh, micro, uh, educational microprocessor. We almost had a deal with Siemens. Siemens was looking at the ARM, but in the end, um, uh, it didn't come through. But it was only when we met Apple uh, that they were willing to invest in ARM, and then we could uh, spin it out. And uh, then we found Robin Saxby to be the first CEO, and that was another fantastic decision. Uh, I'd, I'd known Robin for many years before and because he was um, a, um, a sales manager for Motorola and he was trying to sell me the 68,000 as a follow-on to the 6502, but we decided to do the arm. And then uh, Robin went to uh, the US to do uh, US2 that was um, a, um, a direct right uh, silicon company uh, that was founded by Rob Wilmot and we managed to get him back to head up uh, ARM and that was a fantastic decision because he, he bonded with the team extremely well and, uh, and built a, a great company from a few million revenue to uh, a, a value of $10 billion. And uh, did Olivetti also have a role in, in pushing you towards spinning in spinning uh, Yes, I did. Uh, I did many of these meetings. I did together with El Serino Piol, the vice chairman of um, Olivetti, and we went together to Thompson and to Siemens, uh, and then we did the Apple deal. 
when it didn't pan out with Thompson and Siemens, were you a little bit disappointed, or were you like? We were very, no, we were very disappointed because we knew that the ARM was an outstanding uh, processor with with fantastic characteristics, and I think the people in Thompson and Siemens uh, understood that. They just couldn't understand how they would market the the microprocessor. That was the the sad thing. They couldn't see themselves make a make a business out of it. So how were those guys at Apple and VLSI? Uh, uh, were they sitting around the table, everybody together, or was it mostly Acorn staff? Uh, no, it was um, it was actually the 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 investment decision was uh, done in a very memorable phone call where Larry Tesla said, "Okay, we're going to make this investment," and VLSI technology was uh, on there as well, and. VLSI wanted some special deal. I, I forget what they what they wanted, and Larry Tesla said, "Nope, I'm not going to do this," and put the phone down. <clears throat> and then VLSI came back and said, "Yes, we agree. We agreed to the spin out that was uh, agreed between us and and Apple because VLSI was only a small shareholder, only five percent." So VLSI was investing a little bit, but they they were yeah, a foundry. Very little, but they were the they were the first foundry, yes. And then the first British foundry was uh, Plessy. And uh, and then there was this, those twelve people, uh, who who decided uh, who was going to be at Arm. Like they were from Acorn, right? Yes, they were all Acorn uh, Acorn employees. Well, Acorn was going through quite a difficult uh, period at the time because sales weren't going so well. So some people decided, like uh, Sophie Wilson, decided to stay at Acorn because. Uh, she was really at the at the core of the Acorn uh, computer architecture, not just the microprocessor. Uh, but a number of the other people who were in the ARM design team, because we had uh, lots of silicon designers as well, because of my philosophy of designing on silicon, uh, that whole team um, was spun out and became ARM. And Steve Ferber? He, he and was Steve Ferber went to become professor of computer science at Manchester. Were you trying to get Sophie Wilson and Steve Ferber on the ARM, t on, on the arm group or no? Uh, no, Sophie really was, uh, was quite, uh, it was really uh, the, the heart of the um, Acorn architecture, which wasn't just the chip but it was the whole computer architecture. So we were very keen to have uh, Sophie remain at, uh, at Acorn. And uh, so Olivetti was uh, came uh, like two or three years before to to save Acorn, right? That's right. Acorn had uh, gotten into financial difficulties at the time, and Olivetti took uh, a majority shareholding in uh, in Acorn. And I actually became vice president of research for Olivetti, which was a wonderful time that I had. And actually moved to Italy for for three years to Ivrea, which is Olivetti town, uh, with my whole family. Did you already speak Italian before you moved there? Or you? Uh, no, but one of the conditions that I put on taking on the job was uh, that we would be allowed to take a, um, a language course in Perugia, which we did. So it was a wonderful time learning Italian in this beautiful town. Um, and uh, uh, we, we much enjoyed our time there. So the whole, your whole family speaks Italian? Um, a little bit. The problem with the Italians, at least in Ivrea and uh, the, the people that we mixed with, is that they all spoke very good English. So we didn't, I mean, we can get by in Italian, but our Italian isn't as good as it should have been, uh, given we, um, uh, we lived there for three years, because uh, especially on the R&D side, we, uh, uh, we mostly spoke English. So this spin-out, ARM LTD, this happened, uh, I think, around 26 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And so how long did it take before you started realizing, whoa, this is, this is becoming huge. Well, it took a while because um, it wasn't until Nokia, of course, to, because to start off with, uh, ARM only had two customers. That was the Apple Newton and the Acorn machine. And the Apple Newton was not a great success. And Acorn, although it was, you know, a reasonable company with revenues of about, um, you know, 70 million or so, uh, it the numbers were in the hundreds of thousands a year or maybe close to a million a year uh, not really enough to sustain a, uh, a microprocessor company so it took something like five years before suddenly Nokia came in yes and it was uh, of course we were surprised that Nokia would uh, want such a powerful processor that was designed for a PC 
And they said, no, no, we, we really uh, want to have a very powerful processor because we want to improve the user interface and the, the features that we have in the mobile phone. And then they said, well, but we don't want to buy from a small Cambridge company, we buy from Texas Instruments. And then Robin decided, um, so if you license te Texas Instruments, we might buy a chip. And then Robin decided uh, that this was really the right uh, business model for um, ARM to be a licensing company. So I guess he was flying around trying to convince everybody to do ARM chips? That's right. And then the minute the, um, the first license deal was done with Texas Instruments, uh, he then went out and did other license deals with Plessy in the UK, and now we have uh, five, um, over 400 licensees. Basically, every single uh, semiconductor company in the world now has an ARM license. So it's awesome, right? It's it's just it's, it's so huge, and so you do you meet some once in a while with Sophie Wilson, Steve Ferber, and those guys in the beginning. Uh, yes, we do, uh, uh, and uh, we just recently met again at the uh, Cambridge His uh, Computer History uh, Museum, where uh, Mike Muller, who is the uh, CTO of ARM, gave a, gave a little presentation, and it's it's a very nice group of people, and uh, the amazing thing about the twelve. Uh, people that spun out from uh, um, uh, Acorn is that some of them are still there and are running the company, like uh, uh, the CTO of ARM, uh, Mike Muller. Yeah, he was just doing a keynote last week yeah. and talking about the future. And uh, so the future, the, can we talk a little bit about, um, because I saw you, was, you were talking on BBC at one point when the, so can we be hopeful about the, the future of, let's say, UK technology, right? It's not just ARM, like, uh, um, what do you think about the future? Yes, uh, well, I was uh, very disappointed uh, by the uh, takeover of uh, ARM by um, a soft bank uh, uh, <clears throat> because I was very keen for ARM to remain a UK company and there was no reason to, uh, uh, to change the ownership of ARM. ARM had a billion dollars of cash, was cash generative, has a uh, uh, a management team to die for. Uh, they made all the right decisions over the next, over the last, uh, you know, 26 years. There was no reason to change. However, uh, you know, out of all the acquirers, um, SoftBank really is uh, is probably the best choice because of Masayoshi-san, uh, who um, is very passionate about the Internet of Things. Uh, I had a long uh, conversation with him uh, during that uh, period of. Uh, uh, arm uh, being bought by SoftBank and re he reassured me and I think he means it uh, that he will leave the uh, management in place but he's also willing to uh, invest in uh, making arm the success in the internet of things that um, uh, it deserves to be and so we've got a fantastic opportunity here with arm because arm is already used in probably over 90% of the internet of things worldwide so there is the, the basic building layer hardware layer is already arm and the opportunity i think is to create the internet of things architecture on top of it uh, with the security layer the data access layer all the sort of layers protocol layers that you need uh, on top of it to make to make sure that the internet of um, all the different implementations of the Internet of Things can talk to each other freely, uh, are secure, and can interface uh, easily into the rest of the computing environment. Because the uh, Internet of Things, uh, um, I think you were mentioning that you, you have been doing some uh, talks where you talk about five, uh, and this is the sixth one now? This is the sixth wave, yes. I've got a talk called the Five waves of computing, which uh, a year ago changed to the six waves of computing because they always asked me what the next wave was. And the five waves are the mainframe, the mini computer, the workstation, the PC, the smartphone, and the cloud. People uh, often uh, shouldn't forget, of course, that the usefulness of the smartphone comes because of its uh, connectivity with the cloud. And then the sixth uh, wave that is just about uh, happening now is really the Internet of Things and machine learning. And the machine learning bit, uh, uh, you know, is very important and goes with the Internet of Things because it's the um, availability of the data uh, that we're getting with the Internet of Things that will allow all kinds of really great improvements in our relationship with computers to happen. In particular, the changeover to voice. So we've just seen 
uh, a very dramatic <clears throat> change in our relationship with computers because of touch. Who would have thought that a touch on phones and on, uh, on iPads would make such a, a great improvement in the way we relate to computers? Well, this is nothing compared with the change that is just about to happen uh, with um, uh, the Google Assistants, with Siri, uh, with um, the Amazon Echo. Uh, within the next five years, we'll see the most dramatic change in our relationship with computers uh, enabled by voice. So we just go in any room and we start talking with the walls. Exactly. Uh, so one of the things that I got right in the, in the five waves of computer talk when people asked me about the next wave, my slightly cheeky answer was no computers. And what I meant by that is you do not need a computer yourself because wherever you go, there will be a computing environment. Uh, and, and you can just talk, wherever you are, you can talk to the computing environment and uh, the computer will support you and in a way the biggest fight we're about to have uh, is the fight for the personal assistant, for that, that person in the computer that really understands you, that uh, not just in terms of understanding your voice but also understanding uh, your intentions, your preferences, uh, what you like to eat, to where you like to go, uh, and so on, uh, who you like to meet with and who you are trying to avoid. Uh, and this is very helpful, of course, in planning your life. And you were talking about each of these waves had a leader that was not able to survive for the next wave. Uh, yes, this is true. Uh, this is a, a surprising uh, result of studying these waves of computer. Uh, of computers that at the beginning there's always a lot of competition and we always end up with either a monopoly or in the case of the PC wave a duopoly between Intel and uh, Microsoft and then the people who dominate that wave always miss the next wave uh, because neither Intel nor Microsoft has any appreciable market share in, in the smartphone. Uh, the changeover from the smartphone to the Internet of Things world might be different because the Internet of, uh, of Things is so differentiated uh, that there might not be a monopoly. On the other hand, there might be a monopoly at a much higher level, maybe at the personal assistant level, where <clears throat> there will be a hierarchy of suppliers of all the lower level stuff, like uh, you know the interface to the lights and to the heating system and, uh, uh, and, and all the other Internet of Things. Uh, but the architecture might be uh, set by people like ARM or Apple or Google or Amazon. But it's, it's, it's quite huge, the Internet of Things. If, it, if Masayoshi San was talking about a trillion devices in the next 20 years, yes. Uh, so that's a trillion ARM processors. Yes, so, it is. So uh, it might be quite useful right now to invest a lot of cash into speeding up. Uh, research and development and yes and I think this is this is one positive aspect about the uh, the SoftBank takeover of ARM that um, Masa Hassan has said that he's willing to invest uh, in building up uh, ARM into the key company in the Internet of Things and if that ca can be pulled off as I think uh, uh, ARM absolutely can do that then uh, Arm could become the first uh, 100 billion dollar company, uh, tech company in Europe, probably. Because uh, uh, potentially a little bit uh, the the issue with Europe, uh, kind of, is that the cash is not as accessible, or I don't know, like people are not investing as aggressively as a company like Apple goes and puts a billion dollars to Sharp or whoever makes displays and, you know, just gets iPhones out before others dare invest that kind of money in, into new, new things. Yes, yeah, sadly we don't have uh, uh, technology companies in Europe of the same size and with the same um, uh, financial firepower than, than the US and this is uh, one of the disadvantages <coughs> of the European location. But uh, um, are you, are you uh, uh, positive about the future in Europe, in the UK? Uh, yes, I am. Well, in the UK, UK has just uh, uh, scored a, a fantastic own goal uh, with uh, Brexit. Uh, you know, I've never seen a, a country 
trying to harm itself as much economically as, as Britain is, and let's just hope that at least we don't get a hard Brexit here, but, uh, uh, but a soft Brexit staying a part of the uh, European Union. But uh, Europe itself uh, is um, becoming a lot more innovative. If you look at the startup scene in Berlin, in uh, Munich, in Cambridge, in London, uh, they are clearly not as good as Silicon Valley yet, but the distance between Silicon Valley and these European clusters is shrinking all the time, uh, especially as the, the, the change is to um, uh, uh, more software-related uh, uh, products like fintech and uh, uh, also a big shift into life sciences where Europe has, uh, has some great assets. Because these European uh, uh, startups uh, could have a chance if they are able to like, find a trick and make money, right? It's important to not just have awesome technology. I guess in your career you have experience in, in trying to push the entrepreneurs to think about yes. how to make money. Yes, and one of the biggest opportunities for Europe is actually in fintech, in financial technology, uh, where <clears throat> uh, we do have a very sophisticated uh, financial system uh, in the UK, and a lot of that can be automated with machine learning, with uh, uh, very sophisticated uh, data analytics, and I, I expect uh, uh, many breakthroughs and many interesting, we, we, are, we already have many interesting fintech companies, and indeed, at uh, Amadeus uh, Capital Partners, we've invested in a few of them. So, in the last uh, 30 plus years, you've been an entrepreneur, like a serial entrepreneur, right? An investor, and this is what you do now? Uh, yes, I um, uh, uh, founded uh, Amadeus Capital Partners in uh, 97 with Anne Glover, and uh, we will have our 20th anniversary next year. And right now, I'm seeing more exciting deep technology uh, deals than I've ever seen in my life. So this is a very happy time for us. So it's going to be exciting. You're sitting down with the uh, people that have ideas and you thinking for each one how to customize a package for them, kind of, like what they need. How yes, one of, the, one of the things that we need to do as venture capitalists, uh, I always say we provide two things in addition to money, <coughs> which should be helpful to uh, uh, small companies. One is we make our network of contacts work uh, for, for the companies and the second is we help them think through the business model. We've got to help with business models every time we make an investment. A company only has to get it right once. So we're not any smarter than other people which is start, have a lot more experience in thinking through business models and they turn out to be very important for the success of the company as indeed Arm has shown. Because you have experience in, in many companies, some few succeed and some didn't really work out, right? Yeah, it's indeed, there, there have been lots of failures and uh, there's an old saying that you learn more from your failures, failures from, than from your successes because it really hurts if something goes wrong and you remember that. All right, so looking forward to a, a future success here in, in, in UK. So am I, thank you very much. <laughs>